Slab tables are hard to build. I know that may come as a surprise because like you, I've watched countless videos of giant slab tables being beautifully crafted inside of a 10 to 30 minute video. It turns out some parts are not nearly as easy as they make it look. In this video, I'm going to detail my very first slab table build and show you the lessons I learned along the way. Let's dive in. This is my local lumber yard. Normally I hang out over here in the cheap seats where I can buy a few sticks of black limba, paduke, or walnut for the price of a couple fancy bottles of bourbon. Not today. Today, I'm behind the velvet ropes. I'm in the house payment to Japanese toilet section, the slabs. They keep a good variety of pretty manageable sizes, but this one caught our eye. We were initially drawn to the clean lines and the size, but when we saw this color pop, we were sold. The slab is a wood called Ayek, which I'd never heard of, but after reaching out to the company that imported it, I found out it was cut down in 2019 in Cameroon and narrowly avoided being turned into veneer before making it here to the yard. Loading and unloading. Be prepared for how heavy these things are, because I was not. The weight of this slab alone was probably the biggest recurring hurdle, especially since I work mostly by myself. And every ounce of brute force I put into moving this thing around turned into a gouge or scratch I had to fix later. I used a set of car dollies underneath the frame of my welding table, just in case the casters wouldn't hold the weight. Then, I moved each side a little at a time over to the workbench. I needed to let the slab acclimate to the temperature and humidity of the shop for a few days before the flattening process. So I used that time to get started on the legs, and it was already clear they would have to be beefy. So I sketched up a few variations, but ultimately we decided on this very classic look. I did throw in a little variation just to increase the difficulty and try something new. I was able to generate a detailed drawing from Fusion 360 that helped me get all the necessary angles for the cuts and I had some leftover steel from a recent gate project that would work perfectly. The chop saw works great for the box tubing. But for the flat bar that will mount to the bottom of the table, I'll be using something a little different. Okay, so it's not a real lightsaber, but slicing through metal with plasma is pretty dang close. And the kid in me grins every time I find a reason to use this thing. Both the chop saw and the plasma cutter leave rough edges. So I cleaned those up on the grinder and laid everything out on the welding table. I want there to be a wooden beam that connects and goes through the two sets of legs. So my plan was to use this 4x4 square tubing to sleeve each one. I cut the first one of these way too big, but I got it really close on the retries and was able to dial it in using a handheld grinder. So I cut the sleeves long enough to be flush on the outside and just barely hang over on the inside. Okay. 
I've never been the type to just not do something because I don't know how. Everybody has to start somewhere. I bought this welder about 20 years ago, and while I'm still not very good at it, I've gotten more than my money's worth out of it. I knew I'd have to do a lot of cleaning up with the grinder afterwards, but since this was also going to be the first time I have something professionally powder coated, I really wanted to get this as clean as possible. Recently, I was talking to a friend who builds big tables like this all the time, and I asked him why he had all his bases laser cut instead of fabricating them in-house. Now I understand why. When it was all said and done, I'd spent about four days building these legs, with two full days of just grinding, re-welding, and smoothing up the edges. They're by no means perfect, but I learned a lot about what to do better next time, and they still came out of the oven looking great. The flattening process on something this big can be a little daunting if you haven't done it before. At least it was for me. I started by ensuring I had a relatively level surface under the table that would support perpendicular rails on both sides. Still level. For this, I used some more of that two x five steel box tubing. Then I used a couple sticks of four inch by four inch square tubing for the side rails. This stuff is called Unistrut. It's used a lot by electrical companies. They hang stuff by all thread. You see it all over industrial buildings, restaurants, all over the place. But because of its shape, it's sort of a C channel. But the idea is I don't want any deflection. Like I can't put enough pressure on this to, to deflect it any noticeable amount, which means the weight of that router isn't going to put any noticeable deflection on it. So this is a good base. For the sled portion, I used melamine. I chose melamine because it's reliably level and should allow the router to glide easily over its surface. I used shims here to lift up the sled between the unistruts and ensure everything was as close to level as possible before attaching it. Then, with a metal straight edge as a guide, I routed out the bottom wide enough for most surfacing bits. As, as much care as I took to try to level this, you can see it's off by about a 32nd of an inch on one side. And so every pass is causing it to put a divot in. I knew I wasn't gonna be able to adjust the screws and get it any closer than this existing setup. So to remedy this, I put a few layers of painter's tape on the low side of the sled to bring it closer to level. It was making a huge mess but at least it seemed to be working now. This slab was high in the center and low on the outer edges by about a quarter inch at worst. But this whole process went a lot faster than I thought it would once I got going. The real hurdle for me was that I had opted to build my own sled. So you could save that time by buying a pre-made sled, though all the ones I looked at were quite expensive. I gave everything a quick sanding down to 80 grit, initially with my orbital sander, but discovered that it was way easier to use the belt sander for the first few passes and then clean it up with the orbital. 
With the rough preparations done to the top, I summoned some help to get it flipped over. I didn't get footage of that this time around, but it was not easy. I put the moving blankets under it to minimize scratches and gouges while I worked, as well as to seal off the top while I got started on the bottom. The two things that gave me the most anxiety about this build were the flattening process and insetting the legs and support channels in the bottom. Well, that and dropping it on myself or someone else causing grievous bodily harm. But after a light sanding, I decided not to flatten the bottom. Because one, the curve was unnoticeable now that the top was flat. And I was also afraid that it would look unnatural at the edges and ruin the live edge look. So now, I just needed to conquer hurdle number two. This C channel needs to be placed inside a slab table of this size to prevent the wood from breaking or cupping with temperature and humidity changes. Along with the legs, they have a round hole in the center, but elongated holes on the outside edges to allow for that expansion and contraction. But the C shape of the channel will keep everything nice and straight over the years. At this stage in the build, especially with the top laying airtight directly on the table. It's important to cover the other side to prevent the cupping we talked about from happening. To that end, I used plastic and towels anytime I'd be away for a while or overnight. I swapped out the surfacing bit for a flush cut bit and clamped down some leftover trim pieces to use as a guide. It was time to route out the channels for the legs and supports. I've only done minimal plunge routing outside of using my CNC machine, so I expected there would be some hiccups along the way. But this ended up being really laborious and took a long time to finish. I had to do multiple passes at different depths. Pretty sure I needed a sharper router bit as well, or maybe even a heavier duty router. No matter the cause, I definitely need more practice at this part. I used two coats of poly to seal the routed channels before installing the supports. I also used Loctite to make sure they don't back out over time. Then, I sanded the bottom of the table from 80 to 120 to 150 grit before applying four coats of poly. And just look at that color. One of my friends and neighbors was nice enough to come help me flip this thing one last time. The top was already sanded to 80 grit, so I filled the most noticeable cracks in the grain with Starbond clear adhesive and activator, then sanded it all back down to 80. This took an hour or so, as I had to refill some of the cracks a few times. After 80 grit, I sanded with 120, then sprayed the whole thing down with water to get the grain to stand up. Once the green was up, I did one final pass with 150 to get ready for the finish. Using Rubio Monaco, I started working it in with the spatula, but really didn't like how it looked and I was afraid it wasn't soaking up very well. So I finished distributing the oil with the spatula and my gloved hands, then used a buffer with a microfiber cloth followed by a buffing cloth. I know this wasn't the approved method, but I misread the instructions and ordered the wrong pads. I let the finish cure for a full day, then attached a red Scotch-Brite pad to my sander and buffed it down to a hazy surface.
This time, I picked up the right path and was ready to apply my second coat of Rubio Monaco. This was the first time I'd used Rubio Monaco, and it already looked amazing. But I wanted to take it one step further and add a ceramic coating. I went with N3 Nano for a few reasons, but mainly because it was super simple to apply and looked amazing in the videos. I applied two coats of the hard coat the first day and allowed it to cure for 24 hours, then applied two coats of the top coat the next day. try and match the red heart of the IAC. I picked up this African mahogany and glued the two pieces together overnight. I ran it through the planer and then cut it down to size to fit into the base. Using the trim router, I rounded off all the hard edges, then sanded it down and applied the Rubio Monaco. In retrospect, I should have done all this at the same time as the top, but hey, I'm learning something new here. My neighbor came over again and helped me flip the slab and lift the base up onto the table. If I do many more of these, I'm gonna need a gantry crane in the shop. I used Loctite on these bolts and tightened the center all the way down, but the outer bolts were just snug to allow for the expansion and contraction I mentioned earlier. Fully assembled, this table weighs at least six to 800 pounds, and we were not looking forward to getting it off the workbench. Until I was helpfully reminded that I have a tractor that could do that for us. I was really nervous about this being my first big slab table build, but I think it turned out amazing. I learned so much during the process and look forward to the opportunity to build another. I hope you learned something as well, but more importantly, I hope that seeing the struggles I overcame in this build give you the confidence to get out there and build something yourself. Thanks so much for watching, and please check out the description for links to tools and materials used in this build, and when the time is right, please consider joining my Patreon as we build out that community. See you next time.